Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin our study here with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence into our study this morning. We're grateful for the time that we have each morning to open your word and to receive your guidance and direction and understanding about the things that are happening around us. And also, Lord, to receive your counsel to us uh, that we may uh, be prepared for the events that are coming. We ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to each heart and that you can provide each of us of our needs. And we ask, Lord, that as we attempt to put these things on a line, that you can guide and direct our minds and help us uh, to have an understanding of these things. Help us to re reflect your character to all those around us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Now, we're, we're dealing with chapter eight, putting this on a line, uh, continuing from yesterday. <clears throat> and we know this is gonna be about Gideon defeating Ziba and Zalmuna. I actually went back and looked at our presentations when we were originally were studying this in Judges, uh, that was back in July. So it's quite a while ago, um, we've covered a lot of ground. So we may not remember everything that we, uh, we understood at that time. And we may understand some things a little bit differently. <clears throat> now, as far as uh, putting this on a line. So when we go to the lines that we had, we had just started. So we had put this call from Judges 719 as the beginning of this line, lining up with uh, the other calls, so to speak. And, and then we have, we put Judges 8 there on November 9th, 2019. Um, that's where it's it's on, but it's it's obviously not 2009 to uh, November 9, 2019, because we already have July 18, 2020. So we put Judges 8 1 there, but we haven't decided what date that is. The men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus that thou calledest us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply, and he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison to you? It is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of A.B. Ezer. God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, or of Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. So the question is, where would we mark this? So we have July 19th, but now we have this challenge um, being put towards the message of July 18th, 2020, message of Gideon. Um, and so we have Ephraim here in this context saying that they weren't called. So where would we place this? What, what history is this describing? Because I'm taking the position that Judges 8 is going to be addressing um, a line that is a zoom in to December 25th, 2021. <clears throat> so this would be some history after July 18th, or technically after July 19th, if the call is on July 19th. And so we're going to put these, these, the story of Judges 8 here. Um, so what's happening? What, what is occurring here with Ephraim? What is Ephraim representing? What message is being represented by Ephraim? Uh, 
<clears throat> is it not those that heard the message of July 18th, but chose not to participate in that message? Okay, so you're saying that there were people that didn't participate, and now they're going to be challenging um, the message of July 18th. Now, when we say not participate, what do we mean by that? Because they obviously did participate because they were there at the call uh, to go to the Jordan and but they're going to slay Oreb and Z. The call, the call to go to the Jordan was after the battle had been engaged and after the 300 had given their warning message. Okay, so there's a people that's called and the battle that, that occurs is occurs on July 18th, right? Right. That's how we look at it. So, so there's this call on July 19th. Now, maybe that's not where we should place that call. Maybe we could place it somewhere else. But I using using Judges seven nineteen to represent July nineteenth, um, because after July eighteenth, I mean, there are a group of people that were there with July eighteenth, but they were not really totally behind July eighteenth. Would it represent that group of people? That they, they're not involved in Gideon's call or, or in Gideon's message. So they're not part of the 300, so to speak. They're not there at July 18th. And what does that mean? Or is this some other message that... Uh, see, the way that I would look at it is when I looked at July 18th, I didn't really see much support for it. I saw support for Jeff and for FFA, but I didn't really see a, a support for the July 18th message itself. That is, people weren't really studying it from my perspective. So, so maybe this is something to do with... Um, the chronology behind July 18th that's going to be challenged. I, I just don't know how we would take the story exactly, the symbols here. Ephraim, because Ephraim is called after, uh, after Gideon's 300 uh, break their pictures, right? And we're marking this as, you know, July 18th, that's going to be Judges 7, 18. And then we're going to have this call to the Ephraimites, to Mount Ephraim on July 19th. So how is it that somebody's called on July 19th? All right. Or, or what would that, that message be? Who is it calling? Was the house of Gideon and his father, was that grievously infected with idolatry? Well, yes. Was, and, and do we see examples throughout the Bible of Ephraim, which is representing Israel, being grievously infected with idolatry? In fact, isn't the warning given that Ephraim is joined to their idols. Yeah, alone. yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so Ephraim then would be a symbol of the idolatry that exists. Right. Okay. Which is this idolatry, of course, is man's opinion over God's word. Exactly. Okay. Now, we have those. When this message was made public. Mm hmm within the church, the corporate church itself. There were many that stood up against this. Yes, they recognized that this was a message given by Mrs. White, mm -hmm. 
but it was a message that they did not believe should be given in the manner in which it was given. Yes, no doubt about that. Um, and, and we know on, um, on, on June 26th, um, the church, uh, I think Ted Wilson or the church or the general conference put out a statement regarding the July 18, 2020 prediction and, and the publication of, of uh, the warning message to Nashville in that, uh, the Tennessean, right? So, uh, and I think they, they actually made a statement first on uh, June 21st even, but they did make one on June 26th, I believe. Um, could be wrong about that. I got, I got to look that up again. I was looking at it yesterday. You might find it. You might find that it was something that they began working on on the twenty first, and anywhere from there to the twenty sixth. I mean, could also yeah. symbolically involve June twenty second. Yeah. Well, the, yeah, and that, well, I think they did make a statement on June twenty second as well. Uh, okay. But, but the point, the point that I'm making is that the church is aware because of the Tennessean. Uh, uh, ad, they're for the first time really aware of this movement. I mean, people always thought that, you know, the church, because their local conferences were addressing the 2520 and so forth. But, but really the church at large, the general conference, the administration, wasn't really aware of what was going on with FFA. So we're going to grab their attention for the first time. Um, now, I'm going to begin... Uh, right away after July 18th, uh, addressing uh, these, that is, I'm going to be on social media, um, talking about July 18th with people who are condemning uh, the publication in the Tennessean, uh, Adventists who are doing that. And uh, so, so this is going to be before July 18th, right? So I'm going to be doing that then, and I'm going to do it after July 18th. So I'm still going to be addressing this, um, all of those things regarding uh, regarding that. So now on July 19th, right? So we're going to say that there's a call, but could we put this call earlier, or are we just going to put it on on July 19th? Because we're, we're, the church is going to be aware of things. So maybe that period of time from the 21st all the way to July 18th. Um, is the, it, maybe it could represent the rejection of the initial uh, reluctance of the Ephraimites to join in July 18th, but, that the call, but after July 19th, it represents a specific call. I don't know. I know. I'm just not sure how to do that. Maybe I'm stuck a little bit on Judges 9 or 719 and just I think mark. you are. Okay. Now, the, the, the problem or the point yeah. is <clears throat> as, we, as we look at this, the church comes out with their statement. Mm -hmm. they, are now, they are now basically saying that there's nothing, nothing to see here, nothing to worry about. Go on with your lives. Mm -hmm. Now, our situation is that we have seen that this message was to be given. We were to trust God and not trust man. Therefore, we were to abandon the idols that had so grievously infected the nation, or as we would see it, the church. Yeah. So if we're gonna if we're gonna do that, we would go to the line of Gideon there that's marked by Judges six, because that's gonna tie in September eleventh and November 9th. And and we know that 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 Ephraim doesn't join, they don't, they don't come in that initial call. That's in Judges 6, right? 
because they're not addressed directly, they could have joined with Manessa and um, Zebulun and, and Naphtali and so forth in, in that call, right? According to the spirit of prophecy. I'm not disagreeing with that. So, so we could say that Ephraim represents this idolatry of the church itself. And we address that, that um, we can see it here. If you're going to just address it to the church itself, you can see the June 21st, June 22nd um, in Judges 6, 21 and 22. I mean, that's going to be their opportunity. But that, that idolatry has infected the movement, right? So what we have after July 18th is we have people in this movement who really, well, one is they go back to the church, right? Okay, right. It's not happening, not just then, but all through that history. Um, people going back to the church, and, and especially in response to when we started doing time setting. We saw people leaving this movement. And really, they had no place to go but back to the church or to the world, right? Some weren't really ready to go back to the world, so they went back to the church, which is really probably worse. No, I mean, they had three choices. Mm -hmm. They go back to the church and continue to be <coughs> spoon-fed of milk with no yeah. meat. They can go to the world. Or they could choose to study for themselves. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, but you can have people, too, who don't go back to the church and don't go back to the world and study, but still study incorrectly. That is, they're still going to be following men, right? They're going to have their own, their own movement, their own church. They, you know, they still want to be involved in the message in some way. Right. So they're just going to be following whoever, right? So, so you have really four options, I guess, in that sense. Because of those that don't go to the world or go back to the church, um, they're, they're still going to be studying this message on some level. Well, I agree with Angela there, because I think it was pretty clear that on July 19th and 20th that I was uh, making this call. So in, in the chat there. So, so I think I would still put Judges 719 as July 19th. But when we deal with Ephraim itself, Ephraim does represent the idolatry of the church in this context. Would we agree with that? No disagreement here. And even, even when we see September 11th and November 9th in that first line there, lined up together the way that we have done it. One of the things we see about September 11th is its spiritual formation, right? And what this movement had to do, what, what message divided this movement on November 9th was the message of Parminder and Tess, which really was this liberal understanding of things. It was really going back to the church. I mean, so much so, that um, the other group started using the Sabbath school quarterly um, in their studies, uh, the group in Arkansas. I can't remember which date I saw that on, but it, it was around this time that they, they picked up the Sabbath school quarterly to study. Not sure why, but that's what they did. So, so you have this movement really going back, not just to the church, but to the liberal aspects of Adventism, the most liberal aspects of Adventism. 
to be like the world. And then you're going to see this um, uh, from November 9th, we're, we're taking it, this offering is prepared. So this movement is, um, is looking at this test. We're studying this message of July 18th, and then we publish in the Tennessee and on the 21st. I mean, that's the one that's noticed. I know there was an ad that was put earlier, but it wasn't noticed. I'm not sure what that ad said, but the one on the 21st, that's the one that caught the world's attention. That's the offering and it's going to be accepted. That is the miracle really occurs on the 22nd. And then, and then we have, um, you know, we, we proceed through there and we, we show that the, the fleeces that this is about the studying of the message, right? That's what, that's what that first line is about. And it's going to lead us to January 11th and 12th, 2023. So that's how we understood the first line. Now, when we looked at the second line, um, this is going to focus upon July 18th. Uh, again, it's going to follow the same thing. So it is a type of repeat and enlarge. But here, this is more about the separation down to the 300. And so when we look at the next line, Judges 8, we're going to have to say that this is about um, the message after July 18th. That's the way that I've taken it. And Maybe I'm caught a little bit up on the 719 and the 718, but uh, we do have a call there on July 19th. I mean, that was one of the things that sort of bothered me a little bit with Larry Lesher's argument that, you know, we didn't have anything happen on the day after our disappointment. But I was quite clear that we did. Uh, the presentation that I did on July 19th is, is pretty clearly supporting uh, something very similar to um, Hiram Edson's vision. It is, we have an answer to our disappointment on July 19th. We actually had that answer on July 17th, because I did present it then. But it became really clear on July 19th, when I presented it, what, what had actually happened, and that we were par paralleling Millerite history. So... So if we're going to take the call on July 19th, do we have some event that can, can, that occurs that can match this description of Ephraim complaining? And, and this would then be the Ephraimites that actually joined to some degree in this fight, right? That is, they are going to defeat Orb and Zeb. And, and what does that mean, particularly in this context? Because we have Orb and Zeb representing, what did we have them represent? As we talked yesterday, <clears throat> Oreb can be translated as the raven and Zeb as the wolf. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at it in that way, is Oreb a swift but false message and Zeb as a wolf a stealth but false message. Okay. So, okay. Let me think about this a bit. Or let's let's look up this. Orab. What's that, Rosanna? Look up Orab. I got a different meaning for it. 
Okay. Because I'm not at home, so I can't look it up for you. <laughs> well, the three that the three that I had initially was that Oreb could mean sunset, evening, or raven. Right. Yeah. I uh, it was precious something I got. Yeah, it mean well, it has to do with the color of it, of the bird, right? Dusky. So, so you're saying it had to do with precious? I don't know. I, I haven't seen that one. Something like God's grace. No. Yeah, I don't I don't think that would be a correct wherever you found that would not be correct. Um, so. <clears throat> but anyway, um, what how we understood this, this, this would represent messages that the Ephraimites are going to participate in conquering. Now, it's also a double, doubled message, right? Oreb and Z. We're going to have the same with Ziba and Zalmuna. Um, now, would, would, would it be a false midnight cry message? How would you look at it as a false midnight cry message? Well... See, I'm thinking that this still goes back to those that rejected the message of Parminder and Tess. Okay. Right. So, so that those messages were going to have a group of people, Ephraimites, that they're going to participate. That is, they're not fully necessarily behind July 18, 2020, but they're part of this movement in that. They've rejected the message of Parminder and Tess. And, and we've seen this. We've seen people, um, the main reason why they, they were following uh, Jeff instead of Parminder and Tess is a lot of it had to do with their political views. Um, there was sort of a disgust with the position of Parminder and Tess, but not necessarily an understanding of the theological issues involved. Right? So, they didn't necessarily understand um, what Parminder was talking about. Some people weren't even really watching Parminder so much uh, or Tess. Um, they just didn't sympathize with what they heard about what Parminder and Tess were teaching. They didn't really know much about the chronology or the issues involved, but Jeff took a stand against Parminder and Tess. And now we have this, uh, group of people who are supporting July 18th, sort of, but not really. That is, they're not behind July 18th. They're waiting for it to, to pass um, so that, you know, we can move on with things. You know, so I don't know if we can really fit it in this way or not, but I'm just going by what I remember seeing happening, that people weren't interested. There was people not interested in time setting. They weren't really interested in July 18th. They weren't um, supporting it fully, but they weren't speaking against it as such. After July 18th, um, we have a call to everybody who is involved in the disappointment. That would include those of the Ephraimites. And, 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 so, but how this story all fits in, you know, how all the details of it fit in, I don't know if I have a good answer for it. But we know that in Judges chapter seven, that they are called, right? And now I'm taking 719 as this, this event, I'm taking this whole thing, but you know, I could be wrong. Right, I could be wrong with taking 719 and putting it as July 19th, but it, it's this whole period of time. 
July and onward. Maybe that's just not the best way to look at it. So I don't know. <clears throat> but that's the part I see anyway. I see that we have um, we have people infected by idolatry that are going to defeat some enemies. I mean, that's the very basic way that we could look at this. So maybe maybe we need to revive revise where we start this line. I don't know. <clears throat> See, but I was I wasn't looking at this line so much um, externally either, right? When I'm looking at um, this line, I mean, to me, it's going to be more about what happens within the movement, right? So, I mean, we are touching on the things within the church. Um, and, and the main focus here is going to be Ziva and Zalmuna and the groups that don't participate in that, right? So we just have this beginning here dealing with the Ephraimites. So where would we put this then? So any thoughts on how we're going to deal with this men of Ephraim then? Because they were, they were involved in July 18th. They defeat Orb and Zeb. But now they're going to be challenging the message of July 18th. And we looked at what Ellen White had to say about this. Right. So if we go back to this uh, the statement here about the Ephraimites, just to remind us of it. Gideon knew that he had acted by the divine command, and though harshly censured by those who should have commended, he restrained all feelings of anger or indignation. How easily the spirit of jealousy and discontent might have been fanned into a quarrel that would have caused division, bloods to shed, and ruin. By his self-control, Gideon showed himself a hero. He proved the truth of those words written so long afterward. A soft answer turneth away wrath. In his reply to the Ephraimites, he modestly threw a veil over his own success, but spoke in the highest praise of their achievements. What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Ebenezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Orb and Zeb, and what was I able to do in comparison of you? He represented the victory gained by himself and his army of 300 men as of little in comparison as little in comparison with their taking the princes of Midian. And he further showed that the glory belonged neither, neither to him nor to them, but to the Lord. Gideon's modest and prudent answer appeased the anger of the men of Ephraim, and they returned in peace to their homes. How much of the trouble that exists in the world today springs from the same evil traits that actuated the men of Ephraim? And how many evils might be avoided if all who are unjustly accused or censured would manifest the meek, self-forgetful spirit of Gideon. So one of the things that we can see here, if we're, if we're going to try to address it just in this general sense, you know, how have we responded to the censure, to the accusations that have come against uh, the July 18, 2020 prediction? Have we gone on the attack? We've been defensive. No. Yeah. Have we drawn a line in the sand and created a, a battle? I would hope not. Yeah. So, so I would think that, you know, what we have sought to do is to follow this counsel. Now, I know personally I, I, I got in a couple of situations where um, you know, I was drawn into some situations. I'm not trying to excuse my actions, but I knew that at the time, um, what was being said was incorrect. 
and I tried my best to address what was being said incorrectly in, in as unoffensive a way as I could. So we had the situation we had with uh, Mark Johnson when he was saying that when we take the vaccine, we're no longer human. Um, and then he said a bunch of things that had nothing to do with anything that I was objecting to. And, and then I said it, what he was saying was nonsense and trying to say that what you're saying is nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. You've just said a bunch of things that have nothing to do with the topic. But, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I should have said it some other way. But I wasn't upset with him or anything. Um, and then we had the situation where I was asking Colin, trying to get him to clarify something. And, and he thought that I'd been there at the whole study that was on December 25th, 2021. But I hadn't been at the study because I had to have a nap after doing all those other studies. And so I came near the end of his study and was supporting what he was saying, but I wanted him to clarify a point. And then of course that created a, a whole uh, issue because someone stepped in and said, you know, that I should stop talking or asking questions and let him finish. And I didn't see how I could do that because he needed to answer that question. That, so, so some people could look at it and say, well, you failed in this regard, you know, that I should have been more prudent. I wasn't as prudent as I could have been. So, I would say overall that we are trying to follow this council, whether my personal failures in, in these two instances um, can be excused or not is not really the issue. The issue is, are we generally trying to do this? And I would say that we are. Yeah, we try to we try to have an even and balanced look at at what people are saying. We don't misrepresent them. That we don't pre present them as heretics, and we don't attack individuals um, and question their Christianity or anything like that. And we definitely don't shun them and and cut them off. Right. So, you know, this is what we're supposed to be doing. This movement should be following the counsels given in the spirit of prophecies, prophecy in regard to how we deal with differences among brethren. So we could say that we have that one group that's approaching this as, um, as the Ephraimites, or maybe not a group, but individuals who are approaching this as the Ephraimites did trying to find some accusation or excuse and, and those that are seeking to be peacemakers as Gideon did. But we also know that the characteristics of the group or of the individuals that we see here uh, that are typified by the Ephraimites is that one is there is idolatry, but there's also um, jealousy. So if we take that into account, when we look at Judges chapter eight, the beginning part here, how are we going to take this? Where, where are we going to place this? Do we have some event that we can mark in this movement to place Judges 8 verses 1 to 3? So we're trying to place this within a recent past event. Yes, because we're placing this within the movement. Okay. <clears throat> the, 
would this be in line with December 6th? Yeah, so that's kind of what I initially had thought. So initially what I would do is I would take this and I'd put December 6th. Right. So so that this this initial response is in response to um, the people who took over FFA, right? Bronwyn and those, right? Not so much specifically what happened later, but what happened here in December 6, 2020. Because definitely at that time, the approach that we had from July 19th to December 6th was um, it was we weren't taking a position that was at odds with anyone. We were just studying, right? We're just trying to understand this message. I was interacting with, with people who were challenging the time setting um, as they saw it. And that, you know, we should, and, and Bronwyn had brought up this committee, whatever you want to call it, um, to examine how to understand July 18th. Of course, it, the, the result was already predetermined, and they made specific, uh, chose specifically uh, people that were going to support their position. I mean, that's how they saw it. So they weren't going to even have the Canadian group involved. They, you know, they had representatives from North America, um, but they didn't have me involved or, um, you know, anybody who was really involved in the July 18, 2020 prediction at all, right? So, I mean, they did have me submit a paper. Well, they didn't submit a paper. I, I had a paper and they asked if they could share that as the evidence, but they completely misrepresented that paper, what it was saying, right? So that was the paper called after July 18th. So, so this is my initial position is that this is going to represent that group of people or that message that's much more attached to the church, right? That's why we're, we're gonna look at Judges 6 as the, the church doesn't join in um, this preparation of the message, because they're passed by at 9-11, right, September 11th, right? So if you look at this chart, the way that I would look at it is the church is passed by here, right? September 11th, and we're going to look line that up with November 9th, 2019. I think that'd be correct. So we can see that these two... One is external and one is internal. Um, they, they really mark the same event, right? Because we're going to see it November 9th that those that really are accepting spiritual formation, and I'm saying that Parminder and his group is really in line with spiritual formation, right? I mean, we see that quite clearly. I mean, they're even going to have people confessing to the elders, just like uh, a Catholic would confess to a priest, right? Right. So, so they have all this insanity going on. So we can see that they're really in that same spirit as the spiritual formation that happens on September 11th. So, so now we see then that, that this history, this group does not um, not really come to the call. But yet, we know that the teachings of Parminder and Tess had infected many people in this movement, because on December 6th, they're going to make the same arguments that Parminder and Tess made, right, regarding July 18th. They could have just had Parminder write it. Correct? Well, yeah, yeah, the 
a lot of the situation that went on at that time was kind of strange. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on the one hand, they rejected Parminder and Tess. They defeated Orb and Zeeb, right? But yet they still really are of the same spirit. Agreed. Okay. But we know that the way that that uh, we approached it in our studies is we weren't, you know, we, we were making a call, but we weren't trying to um, undermine anybody. We weren't trying to uh, draw attention to ourselves. We were still trying to work with FFA all through this, pe this period, right? So on December 6th, you know, we expect to have a study there in the morning on Daniel chapter 11. And of course, there's no study. And we're cut out of the, at least I am, cut out of the WhatsApp chat. So I can't even communicate and find out what's happening. So I have no more communication other than this uh, declaration is emailed to me. Um, but just no response, right? Nobody wants to talk about it. They're done with us, right? They did all the talking a couple of weeks prior to December 6th. <clears throat> and they're gonna misrepresent completely what I had been teaching and what I had been saying in my papers. So, and so whether, you know, and what we don't see here really is in how Gideon acts with the Ephraimites, um, I mean, he is acting prudently, but I don't know if that, that's necessarily very effective in, I, I, it doesn't really show it either in the spirit of prophecy. Um, I mean, he does avoid a, a confrontation, right? But he doesn't necessarily win over the Ephraimites. I mean, they're not going to have a battle with him in that sense. It says, but they returned in peace to their home. So there's no battle. And, and we don't see that with December 6th either, right? I mean, whether we want to see that parallel is, I mean, they have their declaration. They go their way. We go our way, right? Would that well, be how we would see okay. it? The, the situation there with December 6th to put a little bit more in context. Okay. After July 18th, there were a lot of questions that were being asked. There was a lot of, of situations that had gone on. Mm. Now, <clears throat> leading up to the, the situation in November, because there, there had been another meeting that had been called at the very end of October. Mm -hmm. I flew down for that meeting. I was there. Yeah. There were a lot of, of questions and a lot of conversations that were going on, but the majority of these were how to distance FFA from the July 18th message. It was not to examine it. It was not to, to consider points. It was to distance FFA okay. from that message. And what seemed to be being addressed was that because this message was seen as being a complete and utter failure, that they wanted nothing to do with anyone that had presented anything to do with 
that message. Okay. So they put together this, this group. They, they had an election, which it, it was basically, you know, strange because of the way that it was handled as to who was going to contribute and who was going to have a say in this. They wanted to make sure that what they said was completely unified. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it was at the meetings, because there, there were twice that I flew down to FFA, it was at these meetings that I first heard of what they called the Thanksgiving prediction. Mm -hmm. And the comment that was made was very direct, that the Thanksgiving prediction was completely off the rails. There was nothing good of it. And I just needed to accept this. And I said, well, I don't accept things based on somebody else's word. I examine it for myself. So how can I do that? Well, you're just going to have to accept what we're saying. And this, for me, was very disturbing because I don't handle things that way. Mm -hmm. Now, when it came to this with December 6th, they had had several times that there had been online little meetings that they, that they wanted to have with different parties. Mm -hmm. Guy was part of it. Um, the, um, the, the couple that had been doing most of their, of the work in Hispanic areas. Um, he had spoken several times and so had she. And I, I, I just can't remember their name at the moment. Um, you're talking about Noel? Yes, Noel and Heather Del Rosal. Yeah. All of these were asked to contribute and give their opinion as to what was going on. So by the time they came down to this on December 6th, it was a, we don't even want to study with people that have anything to do with July 18th. Now, we've seen quite a bit of the same attitude that's been occurring with those that just do not wish to study anything about chronology and it's sad because this is just another form of idolatry in placing man's opinion above god's word so do we have the same thing or do we have something different here are we, I mean, can we place this onto a line? Yes, I think we're going to have to. But in how, in how and how can we make this line up with what we've been addressing? In what manner do we go forward? Yeah. Now, I sent a link here that at minute 10, Jeff starts talking about the Thanksgiving prediction. Right. Um, so that's just a YouTube video. I, I think it's still there. Maybe not, but it should be. I, 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 I guess I could click on the link to make sure it works. Uh, nope, it's not available anymore. So, um, no, so I don't know what to do then. Um, yeah, so they took away his support uh, of the Thanksgiving Day prediction. So one of the things that they they didn't do, because I mentioned this before, because on November 10th, 2019, 
we, we had three meetings on that, uh, two of them that I presented and the third one Jeff presented. And then later on, Jeff is going to present this, um, uh, what he, his take on it, you know, publicly. But they never did release the three videos that they recorded of me and Jeff. And, um, but then they misrepresent the whole thing as part of their argument against me as a person and everything that I'm teaching, which was completely unfair. I mean, you know, because it, it was quite clear that the reason that I made this Thanksgiving Day prediction, that it came to us, was to see whether we could predict external events or not, right? That was the whole purpose, in my view, of why God gave us that information regarding Ellen White's visions, and also how the, the Thanksgiving, um, how Thanksgiving Day was uh, connected to the lines that we already had. And Jeff acknowledges this connection. But what we couldn't even agree on is how it was fulfilled afterwards. So that was um, just another issue for me. So for them to bring this up as if I somehow made some prediction and was wrong about this prediction that I was some sort of false prophet uh, was really complete misrepresentation. Now, uh, another point here, so I, I know I'm just going to jump over here. So in Judges 8.1, we see 81. Would that also tie in with um, Second Chronicles, um, where it talks about um, Azariah the high priest and the four score priests? Well, I think the tie-in first that you've got here with Judges 6, 11 being September 11, Judges 7, 3 being November 9th, and then Judges 8, 1, um, again, if we, if we looked at the position that had been presented and accepted within the movement before, 8-1 would be a symbol of midnight. Eight one's a symbol of midnight. It's one of the things that when I've, I've gone back over several things that Jeff had presented, where he was talking about, I believe it was the 1909 general conference session where Mrs. White was 81. And his, what he brought back out was that that was a symbol of midnight. Okay. So I'm looking at this with September 11, November 9, lining up very well with this with Judges 8-1. Okay. Um, now, just, just briefly, mm -hmm. and yes, I'm, I'm stepping back just a little further. The first time I went down to FFA, we were in the midst of doing the study through Ezekiel. I remember because I had a morning that mm -hmm. when, when I was up, I logged on so that I could participate and listen to the study. A brother came to the door of the cabin, wanting to find out if I was ready to go. I said, I'd be out in a few minutes. I was asked later what I was doing. And I said, well, this was the, the study with Theodore and, and the group on Ezekiel. Now, I was told very bluntly, even at that time, that I needed to distance myself from the group. I let them explain their explanation was that they felt that this type of study because of what was being presented and who was presenting it would be detrimental to my spiritual health. So even then there were issues that were being raised. Mm -hmm. Now, 
later, there were a few times that you asked for me to assist in doing the study on specific chapters in Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. When I went down the second time, I was told again that the studies that we had been doing were completely anti-Bible and that I should consider severing all ties in these studies because what was being taught was in error. I looked directly at the party that said this. And I said, now I am taught in several of these studies. I have presented in these studies. Where is the, where, where is my path wrong? Where was I incorrect in what I presented? And no answer could be given because they had not observed the studies. This attitude, this opinion, this idolatry has existed and has infected this part of the movement for a long time. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I mean, to follow the counsel, the simple counsel, to sit down and study with people and to understand what they're saying um, and to be willing to be corrected if you're in error, that's extremely important. I mean, I mean, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't know hardly anything that I know today about the scriptures. I would just be stuck on, you know, whatever it is I thought before. And, and we see this sort of approach all the time. I mean, I was discussing with a guy on um, academia and, uh, you know, he's uh, an anti-Trinitarian and he just goes way too far, right? Jesus isn't really eternal and the Holy Spirit really doesn't exist as a person. And, you know, when I bring up the spirit of prophecy quotes, he says, show it just from the Bible, even though he's a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, show it from the Bible only, right? And then when you show it from the Bible, well, that's not good enough because you're now using philosophy. You have to explain it. I need a plain statement, right? And, and we see this type of thinking all the time. Sunday keepers do it all the time. Where's the, where's the verse in the Bible that says, Christians are to keep the seventh day Sabbath. You won't find that first. You know, you're not going to find the plain statements of all these controverted points, else they would never have been controverted points in the first place. Maybe, maybe they might have been. But, you know, we need to follow this counsel that's been given us in the spirit of prophecy. And we just seem unwilling to do that. you know, as a movement. <clears throat> so, so we're saying with December 6th that, that the, the symbol of, the, of 81 uh, relates to, uh, okay, I'm going to read this here. Uh, Let me see if I can. Okay, the Battle of Raphia was the deciding battle of the Fourth Syrian War. Unexpected victory for the notoriously cruel and immoral king of the south, Ptolemy, the, Ptolemy the Fourth, Philopater. The whole region provides praise to Ptolemy, including the Jews who invite him to Jerusalem. He accepts invitation and goes to Jerusalem. A uh, Jerusalem's heart, uh, Jerusalem heart shall be lifted up. Daniel 5, 23, 2 Chronicles 26, 6 to 21, the king of the south attempts to offer incense, resisted by 81 priests, receives a mark of leprosy on his forehead. Now, so we have this symbol here, and it's a symbol of midnight, right? That's what you're saying? 
Um, this, this is from Jeff's video. This is just the uh, transcript thing. Right. Um, right. So he's, he's making the case that this is midnight. Uh, after defeating the USA at midnight, Russia shall be lifted up. So this is how we were understanding this. Um, and we were going to put that in November 9th, 2019, right? But now we're taking that symbol of midnight, Judges 8-1, and we're lining it up with this November 9th below as December 6th, 2020. I would agree. Yeah, so the priests here, would not be those that issued the declaration. They would be representing Uzziah, right? In 2 Chronicles 26. Right, because Uzziah is going to go and offer and burn incense at, at, the, on the, at the altar of incense, right? He's going to act as a priest. And these people are acting as priests, aren't they? Correct. But they're not the priests, are they? No. Right, because they rejected the message of the priests. Exactly. Right. So the priests here would have to be those that continue with the message of July 18, 2020. If we're going to use that term there. Okay, so... So I, I think that fits. Okay, so, so we now have that, that event, December 6, 2020, as Judges 8, verse 1 to 3, but starting in verse 8, well, verse 1. So now we're going to have to look at uh, the events that follow. So in, in Judges chapter 8, starting on verse 4, Gideon came to Jordan and passed over. He and the 300 men that were with him, faint and yet pursuing. And he said unto the men of Succoth, Give, I pray you, loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Midian. So the message of July 18th crosses the Jordan, right, passes over the Jordan, and it has the 300 men. But are they going to be getting support? No. Okay. Is, is this what we find happening in this movement? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So... Now they're pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of the Midianite of Midian. So they're pursuing this, pursuing this twofold enemy. The princes of Sukkoth are not going to give them bread, right? Correct. Right. And. Now, of course, it, they said to the men of Sukkoth, but it's going to talk about the princes of Sukkoth won't, won't give them bread. <clears throat> so, so what is this particularly talking about? Now, we know Zeba and Zalmunna, this has to do with sacrifice and um, shade has been denied, right? So sacrifice and shade have been denied, is what it's saying there. Now they're pursuing an enemy, right? So this is a message. What, it, what is this message that needs to be defeated? after December 6th, that there's no support for. If, if that's the right question to ask. I think you might want to refine your question a bit. Okay, well, 
because I, I don't really have an answer to this. I'm just looking at the, the basic idea. Of we, we take Zeba and Zalmuna represents a message. But, okay, Zeba and Zalmuna represent a message, but what message? Yeah, that's the question. What message do they represent? Because it's something that needs to be pursued by the July 18th message. It needs to be defeated. Okay, first we have Oreb and Zeb. Yeah. Then we have Zeba and Zalmuna, which are the princes of Midian. Mm -hmm. We know beginning in Judges 6 and then following up in 7 mm -hmm. that we have the Amalekites the Midianites and the children of the East, a threefold enemy. Right. Now, the position that I suggested yesterday was that this would be a, a, an early representation of the threefold enemy that comes against the 144,000 at the end of the world. Okay. Now, Oreb and Zeb have been defeated. Zeba and Zalmuna are being pursued. Yeah. Is the pursuit of the message of July 18th that we need to place man's word subject to God's word. Is this pursuing the message that all idols are to be removed? Okay. So that's, so that's the message that so we're seeking to remove these idols that are Ziba and Zalmuna. That's what that that's the premise that I would present. Mm -hmm. Now Ziba and Zalmuna, they had been involved in what situation previously? Outside of this battle? Yeah. I'm not recalling. Okay. So we had looked at before. Let me see if I can find it. And that is... So when we studied this before, we had noticed something. Um, let's see. They were involved in the situation dealing with uh, Deborah and Barak, the battle there. But I'm trying to find where that was. Um, okay, so, um, right, so they talk about this. I just can't find the verse. Um, well, they talk about Mount Tabor. So it was at Mount Tabor that this occurred. So maybe I'm getting this mixed up, but um, right. So remember that they talked about the form of the children of a king. Uh, they are recognizing those that they slew were presenting before them the character of a king. Um, 
because they refer to Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor, so the Judges chapter four, they're also speaking here of what was occurring before during the time of Deborah and Barak. So this is going to be, when they talk about those that they slew, it's going to be in the time of Deborah and Barak. Do we remember that? I mean, this was a study we did on August 8th, or August 1st. I mean, that we looked at this before. This was a while ago. Um, yeah, so this is 818. So it's going to refer to this event. And that event is his judges for um, Mount Tabor. So they're talking, they're basically bragging about those that they killed. Right? Then said he unto Zeba and Zalmunna, what manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, as thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. And he said, they were my brethren, even the sons of my mother, as the Lord liveth. If ye had saved them alive, I would not slay you. So this issue this point at Mount Tabor would have been in Judges 4, right? That's that's how we took this against the 10,000 men, right? The 10,000 men come and, and fight. So, so would this be an error then that has been um, persistent in the movement that goes back to the time of Parminder and Tess. I think it would have to be. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So you're putting the link to that presentation there, uh, Aran? Okay, so that's the presentation. If you start the one he gave the link to, uh, that's the presentation that Jeff did um, about the, the Thanksgiving prediction and his take on it. So, um, so it's, it's entitled Settled in Nashville. It was done on in 2019 on uh, the 16th of November. So it's going to basically be um, the week after I presented it to Jeff. Well, six days after. Right. So that's why he's going to address it there. So they had taken that off their site for some reason, eh? Okay, so we're, we're going to take this uh, story of Ziba and Zamuna. We'll come back to this verse again, but um, Ziba and Zamuna represent a, um, a message or an understanding that needs to be removed. And it's not going to be the, the, the pursuit of Ziba and Zamuna is not going to be su supported by the men of Sukkoth, and it's not going to be supported by um, what's the other place here? Penuel, right? Okay. Where we have the Tower of Penuel, so which would represent uh, Penuel means, of course, the the face of God and the tower there is representing the watchtower, and that's Migdal. So, um, so the men of Penuel and the men of Sukkoth are not going to support 
this. Now, um, can we can we take can we attach this to to the American group and the Canadian group? Or is that unfair? I don't know that it's unfair, but I mean, we're trying to attach this to messages. Right, but that would be, and when I think of the American Canadian group, I think of two different messages. Because even though they, they combine theirs together, there is a completely different um, thinking in the two different groups. But, you know, that may just be my perspective. Maybe that's a little subjective. Well, so much, so much of what has been going on mm -hmm. has, has been more in keeping with the expressions of Parminder and Tess than it ever has been with what we find within Scripture. We have addressed many times, Elder Jeff addressed many times, the very papal attitude that was being given when they had that meeting in Germany. When they looked to expel Stephen, Odilio, and there was a third, as I recall, for not submitting to Parminder and Tess's authority. Mm -hmm. Now, is this not the same type of attitude when questions have been raised mm -hmm. that has occurred with Daniel Fontenot, that has occurred with others from the Canadian group, that has occurred in many other ways that when, when these questions are being asked, that either they're saying, well, your, your tone is too harsh or you're interrupting, you need to be quiet or we don't want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. I mean, during what led up to December 6th, mm -hmm. there are many times that I ask questions and my questions went unanswered. I was given a choice, separate yourself from Theodore's studies or we are not going to allow you to have access to what's going on here within the WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. To me, that became very personal. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand, and to this day, I do not understand their attitude. But it's the same attitude that we see that was occurring with Parminder and Tess. We cannot afford to take a papal and pagan attitude in dealing with any brother or sister. Either we're going to follow with what scripture has to say and do it in accordance with the way that, that Christ presented this. Mm -hmm. Or we're doing it according to what man says. We don't have a third choice. Yeah. Yeah, so now, as far as the two different groups, whether they, you know, you could take Sukkoth and align it with one group and Penuel with another group. Uh, but I do think it represents at least two different characteristics. Now, we have with the men of Sukkoth, remember, there's going to be the 77 princes. So, right. so Sukkoth has attached to it the symbol of our understanding of the 777 days, right? So the 77 would be symbolic of chronology. So we do have one group within the movement that's opposed to July 18th, or, or at least partly opposed, but is still using chronology. 
Now we know that there are many in this in in these groups that don't actually like when Odilio or Colin presents chronology. Correct? They don't support the use of chronology in, in analyzing the events on our lines. In, in any manner, no. They, they want nothing to do with chronology. Right. So, and, and you'll see when Odilio or Colin is presenting that certain people aren't watching the meetings. Right? Correct. Okay. So they're not going to be participating. They're not going to be watching. They're not going to be tuned in to them. So you're going to see the numbers go down. Um, now, but we have this other group, uh, Penuel, and it's going to be, uh, this is the face of God. And so Penuel is simple, is symbolizing, um, and, and they also have the watchtower of Penuel is what's going to be destroyed, Right. The Tower of Penuel. So there's there's going to be these punishments to these two groups. <clears throat> so what would this face of God and this watchtower, what would that represent within this movement? I don't have a direct answer for you at this moment. Okay. This is something I think I'm going to have to consider through the day. Okay. So we're going to have to think about this and come back to this tomorrow. But, uh, but I think it represents uh, two different errors that we have, the Ziba and Zamuna. Uh, and I would say that these are misuses of things, a misuse of chronology on the one hand and a misuse of authority on the other. That could be a good point. Yeah. But anyway, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all the things that you are doing in our lives. And um, we are thankful for this study. We ask that you can be with us throughout this day, guide and direct us, and uh, bring us together again in the morning to continue uh, to try to understand these things. Help us to be merciful and patient with those that differ from us and to not be judgmental, um, that uh, we can discern truth from error, but that we will not attack the individual, that we will seek to win those that are in error and that we will also be corrected when we are in error. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.